Welcome to the Performance Formula with Jody Martin. Josh, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too, Jody. It's nice to put a uh, face with a name, and it's an honor anytime to get put on any podcast. So uh, this is this is awesome. So I really appreciate yeah. it. Oh, it's my it's my absolute pleasure, and I'm excited in particular because you come from a different sphere yet similar if i can call it like that you know you come from a sport which i've played uh, very little of and um i'm i'm told i have a good good swing but um i'm 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 way start. better at hitting the ball, big ball called the earth compared to the little <laughs> round white one <laughs> a lot of us um, are yeah 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 um, Josh, I like to start these, seeing that my podcast is called The Performance Formula, I, I like to start these conversations because I think they tend to just open up the conversation nicely. If, if there was like in your mind a formula to performance with everything mm. you know and understand about golf or the mental side, what do you think are key things we must consider? If there was such a thing as a formula for performance? Yeah, 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 sure. And, and of course, they're there isn't ever a direct formula, but I, yeah, obviously that's what you're getting at, right? It's it's the idea of um, let's let's do everything that we can within our power, within our control, to make it most likely that we'll perform well. So, with that being said, I I think the the two big things that come to my mind, if there's a formula of like a A plus B equals performance success a and b to me are skill acquisition and skill access those are kind of the two big um pillars two big variables in my mind if if there's a formula so skill acquisition is you're creating and maintaining and gathering the actual skill that is required for your performance so in golf that's I need to be able to hit a seven iron solid where I'm trying to hit it, how and how far I'm trying to hit it. And that is through practice, that's through fitness, nutrition, sleep, hydration, all of those things uh help you acquire skill. But there's some some bleed over into the skill access part, but the skill access part is most of the kind of what we would call the mental game. It'd be a lot of the psychology behind all of this. That's how you access the skill when it matters during the round, during the competition, during the performance. And those are things like freedom, being present, you know, credible, robust confidence, those kind of things. That helps you access the skills that you have been working on. But the bleed over is skill acquisition can help your skill access just knowing that you've been building skill can help you access it better so those kind of those two stick out to me as uh, if there's a formula it's you got to be good at the thing you're trying to do and then you got to be able to be good when it matters right it's i think it's hard to argue with that as the formula yeah, I think the, there's a simplicity in that, right? <laughs> there's a real simplicity sure. in that and a, um, a ease of reference, I think, you know, A plus A. Yeah. Maybe not A plus right, B, yeah. A plus A. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's like I know what I got to do and now it's just a matter of me doing it. Mm. Okay, so how do you practice? How do you gain skill? In your mm. mind, because I mean, it's easy to go. I don't know if golf is similar. So I come from a more cricket background. It's easy to go stand mm. in a cricket net and mindlessly hit balls yeah. and not really get anything from that. So what would you say is, in your understanding, good ways or better ways or more efficient ways to acquire skill? Yeah, so the 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 work of. Anders Ericsson comes to mind, his book Peak, where he talks a lot about deliberate practice. And and rather than, like you're saying, kind of mindless practice, you're you're practicing more mindfully. And then he's got a slew of like a list of here's what deliberate practice should basically cover. And it's 15 or 20 different things like it should be uncomfortable, it should you should be getting 
instant feedback. You should, it should be uh, kind of monitored by a coach. It should be just outside your comfort zone, all of these kind of things. So if your practice isn't hitting at least one, if not a large majority of that kind of list, then your practice is probably more mindless and you're just as, as a, a golf swing instructor once told me, he, he said, then you're just kind of getting a workout, right? You're just kind of swinging a club and you're just exercising at that point. Or if you're just, um, and I know zero cricket, uh, terminology, but if you're just swinging, is it a cricket bat? Is that right? Yes. A cricket bat. And you'll also be swinging it. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. You're swinging a cricket bat. So yeah. if you're just doing that, and what we would call in golf kind of rake and hit practice. So you're just standing still raking a golf ball over and hitting it. So if you're just repeatedly doing that, which there is a time for, right? That's the part of the skill acquisition process is I'd need to actually be able to make contact with this ball. I need to be able to swing a cricket bat well, right? That's part of the process. But if that's all you do, then it's mindless and it's not, it it won't touch on the parts that bleed into the skill access part of it. If you only work on skill acquisition of, I'm just trying to hit this thing well and make contact with this thing in a repeated manner, not really, it's not really difficult. It's just kind of repetitive. Then yeah, it's mindless practice. So then how how would you practice would be, it's got to be, you got to be doing things that are difficult for you. So if it's, if it is the more technical, I'm just repetitively hitting a ball. Well, then it, you need to be working on something that's difficult for you. That's just outside your comfort zone. That's stretching your ability. And then you get into kind of more performance practice. So in golf, that would be, uh, you know, your, the driving range has, you know, four or five flags out on the range at different yardages. So here's one that's at 120, 120 yards, and I'm going to hit 18 shots to there, and I've got to get 14 with on the green within 30 feet, and uh, with within I got to get 14 of those shots in there. So it there's an element of pressure, there's an element of measurement, there's instant feedback, and then some kind of randomized practice where. I'm hitting an eight iron, then I'm hitting a four iron, then I'm hitting this. So with cricket, I, and I, and I relate it to baseball. I think of, um, seems like a similar, uh, environment as baseball where it's, there's not different bats. You're hitting the same bat. There might be different pitches to encounter, but there's so there is some randomization there and there's certainly okay we're going to try to get it I'm going to try to hit this one up the left um foul line in baseball or I'm going to hit try to hit hit it up the right I'm going to try to hit a grounder I'm going to try to hit try to hit home runs so there's different types of practice so if you're only staying in one narrow slot you're not working on all the parts of your brain that need to be engaged when you're in a performance right? Your brain uses several different parts, several different ways of approaching things when you're in a performance. And if, if you only stay in one of those things while you're practicing, then you're not training your brain to be able to flip off the technical switch and flip on the, okay, it's time to perform. It's time to just play, right? You have to practice that. That's a skill you have to practice. I love I absolutely love that. I make this distinction very clearly for uh, all athletes that I work with, especially in technical sports, that um, there's a, we can access it. I call it a technical mind or a performance mind. And they different. Yeah, they're not the same thing. They, 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 they're 100% not the same thing. Um, I, maybe I want to take a moment and educate you, if it's okay. <laughs> Bring it. I <laughs> teach, need you, it. teach you a little bit of cricket. Because it's it, and and maybe I come from this angle because it's in my frame of reference. It's sort of said that uh, uh, golf is technically the most difficult sport there is to play. 
That's what I hear. That's what that, that's that's what I hear too at times. Cricket is not like baseball. It's very similar, but in cricket the ball can bounce. And because right. the ball can bounce, that changes the game completely. So if it's if the ball bounces closer to you, you've got to move forward. For what we call forward, technically you're moving left. And if the ball bounces short, you've got to move back. So there's a there's a consistent every single ball, there's a consistent decision making process that happens. Am I moving forward or am I moving back? Then the ball doesn't have to be thrown into one little square. It can be thrown anywhere on your body, wide, down leg, what we call down leg, which would be like behind your back. And so you have to be able to access the ball in a sort of more space around your body than a, a baseball uh, hitter yeah. would need to. And then lastly is the, the surface on which you play can be completely different. You can get, have surface that you play on that's really fast and bouncy. In other words, when the ball hits it, the ball can actually speed up and bounce and deviate side to side, as well no as the ball can sort of curve in the air, which we call swing, because it's not put in the, it's by shining one side of the ball. So with aerodynamics, mm. the ball can actually swing through the air. So take, the ball can swing through the air land on a pitch and then deviate from side to side after it's landed right in front of you. And it can also do that speeds up to 150 kilometers an hour with about 100 miles or just shy of 100 miles an hour. And then you have spinners who bowl slower, but they can curve the ball because they now spin the ball. So similar to a baseball that would curve. So they can curve the ball. It can land and then deviate in different directions off the pitch. And so the that sounds more technically complicated it, than golf. It is. <laughs> it's so complicated. I think sounds from a decision really making from a decision making point of view, yes. I yeah. think the reference to golf is normally the actually the the actual technicality of hitting the ball. You know. Sure. And, sure. And so I think that's why a lot of people. And I don't know what your sense is, but from a cricket point of view, that's where a lot of people get stuck in the technicalities. There's a there can be a belief yeah. that says if my technique is good, I'll perform better. Mm. Uh, and so we, you know, a lot of time is spent on, am I turning enough? You know, is my hips doing the right. thing it needs to be done? Is my feet doing, is my head in the right place? Is my hands, is my wrists? And so my sense is that normally when they get lost in that sort of stuff, the technical mind stuff, then that hampers performance in a big way. There's no way you're Absolutely. performing if you're busy with that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause your, your, your mind is your mind is in an overly conscious state of trying to control emotion that happens so fast that when, if you were to film someone swing when they're playing and they would say, okay, I'm going to really try to do this in my swing and I'm going to super exaggerate and I'm going to really try to make a different move than I'm used to making and you film it and you compare it to, okay, I'm just going to make my default stock swing. I'm not going to try to change anything. Those two would be very similar. It's, it's really hard to make dramatic changes while you're playing. So when someone goes into a round of golf and says, I'm, I'm really going to try not to do this today. I'm going to try to swing better today. You're, you're attempting to influence something that is is almost impossible to influence on any given day. So now you're you're stuck multitasking the entire round of golf. And and during that time instead of focusing on okay, um I need to be present here, I need to be um freed up and just let it rip, you're now spent okay, I my body is present here but my mind is thinking about the last swing lesson I had, the last range session I had where it went really well. I need to recreate that in some way. So your mind is not lined up with your body. Your mind is elsewhere. So you're not going to perform as well if your mind isn't present with your body. So, and I'm assuming the same is with cricket. And I apologize to all your listeners for my ignorance on cricket. But I, and it, actually it's funny. I live in, um, Morrisville, North Carolina, and there's like a multi-million dollar cricket facility here. It's out. It's outrageous. So I'm actually really close to a. I'm in the middle of a very uh, thriving cricket community, and I just don't know anything about it. I should go to. I should go to to one, but 
um, the 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 challenge is okay. Can I when I go play? Can I be mentally present with what I'm doing? Can I can I let my technique go for today? And I think that um, that translates to everybody. And I tra- I think it translates to any sport, especially in a sport that is, I mean instant reflexes are required you can't be spending that time thinking okay how am i going to do this you have to trust my training has been good enough so now let's see if i can do it right looking at it more like a test of your training rather than this is another form of my training right it's it's um letting go and saying okay let's see what i got today and let's just uh let's do our best to react to what I'm experiencing, which is hard. It's easier said than done. But I think that is a kind of a universal, if we're talking formulas, I think that's a universal thing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe my last thought on the practice, I've never understood why, and I I haven't, I've worked with one or two golfers, played a little Mm -hmm. bit myself, obviously, as I've mentioned, but I've never understood why golfers, even myself, to be honest, but I don't go to a driving range that often. But why do golfers not go to a driving range and say something like, okay, between those two flags and sort of, or if you know your driving range, map out, map out nine holes and say, right, this is going to be my par three hole. Uh, my first hole is going to be driving between those, then that, then that, then that, whatever it might be. And then just doing that, executing that, saying, right, Mm. stepping up and saying, right, now I'm hitting my driver. Yeah. Oh, shucks. I didn't hit the fairway. I'm in the rough. Okay. Next ball, I got to push it into the ground a bit. I'm in the rough now, but now I still got to reach that. I still got to hit my 150 yard, you know, to that flag or whatever it might be, but now I got to hit it out the rough. Right. And Okay. Okay. Now I'm, I'm, I'm next to the, I'm next to the hole. Okay, cool. Let me walk over to the place where you can now go do your chipping stuff. Now I walk over yeah. there. I'm, I'm, I'm off the side of the green. Okay, now let me chip. You know, that's the hole over there. Okay. And then you walk up and you go do the putt. And then you go back. And you yeah. say, right now, this is my next hole. Like I'm not even hitting my driver. I'm hitting my three iron here off the start right. of this hole. Okay, great. I'm in the fairway. So now I can set the next ball up nicely. Okay, cool. You know, okay, I'm straight on the green. Okay, walk over to the green, drop a ball randomly everywhere, putt. And so I feel like if you're doing a performance practice in that sort of way, you put yourself more through the rhythm of a performance rather than just, okay, hitting hitting seven irons, and but you never really play right. the game like that. Right. Yeah, no, that, I'll tell you why people don't do that is because it's incredibly boring and it takes a long time and it's uncomfortable and you have to do things that you aren't good at and mm-hmm. all factors that people don't want to do, they want. They want to hit a bunch of seven irons in a row because by the sixth seven iron, you feel like you got it down and you start flushing them and you, this is, this is easy, man. I'm, I'm pumping up my confidence. I feel like I'm better now. And you get out to the course and you might hit two seven irons all day. Maybe you might not hit any, right? The, the course, the, the way that you, the way that it's, you know, where you're teeing off from for the day, just the way that you're hitting your driver, or it's a shorter course or it's a longer course, you might not hit any. And, and the, just the, the thought of I'm, I'm confident now because I was doing that well, well, you were doing something pretty easy well, right? It's hard to hit a golf ball well. Like, I'm, I'm not saying that you you sh- uh hitting your sixth seven nine in a row should always be good not necessarily i've i've struggled with that myself plenty but the idea that because i can hit 10 seven irons in a row decently and that means i should be confident that means i've got it that means i'm playing well well you're going to get out to the course and be um unpleasantly surprised and that surprise is going to lead to frustration probably starting to go into fix mode why am i not hitting it the same so now i need to change something while i'm playing my technique must be off so i need to recapture that so now you're not mentally present you're multitasking with really your job is not to be pretty out here your job is not to look great be perfect your job is to get the ball in the hole in as few shots as possible and 
when you're thinking more about the how of hitting this one shot perfectly, then you're, you're, you've diverted your attention away from probably the real performance goal for the day. Now that's not to say that you aren't allowed to go out on the course and think about your swing. You, anyone's allowed to do whatever they want, right? You, you just have to say, okay, what are my goals? Well, my goal is to get the ball in the hole in as few shots as possible. Well, then you need to, your mind needs to be present with that. Okay. Well, my goal for this nine holes is to work on my swing. I want to work on my swing and maybe I want to do that kind of practice that you're describing of the driver, then rough, then chipping, then putting. Well, I'm just going to do that on the golf course and I'm going to, um, while I'm doing it, I'm going to be kind of thinking about my swing a little bit to just see you're allowed to do that too. But saying there's only one way to practice and it's just repetitively hitting seven irons. And then I'm going to go to the golf course and continue to try to perfect my swing. Well, then you're always in a working on it mode. You're always in a skill acquisition mode and you never switch your brain over to the skill access mode. And, you know, when it comes time for the club championship or the bigger tournament you're playing in or the, you know, the, the skins game you're playing on the weekend or whatever you are. Now you are more challenged to recreate your technique because you're under pressure now and your brain goes into this kind of threat detection protective mode and you're not going to be able to access your skill one because it's harder to do under pressure and two because you have done no skill access practice whatsoever you've only been in technical mode for the last month and now you just ran, you just magically hope to show up and access it and let it go, let your technique go, your brain is going to be spinning, trying to, one, figure out why is my technique so bad, two, why can't I free up and just let go, You're, that's going to be a long day, you, almost always. So you've got, to, you've got to balance it out to be able to show up on that day and, okay, now let's just let it go and test it. Yeah, I mean, you speak about... Um... Or well, you mentioned earlier the idea of unshakable, I think that's what you said, confidence. And so yeah, I think that's one version think, of it, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think what what, uh, what stands out for me in that is what, what are you actually getting confident in, though? Because if it's just like that mm. mindless type of, so a lot of the time, if you read literature on confidence, it would speak about competence. So when you're competent in something, you feel like, okay, I know I can do that, and therefore I feel more confident. But my sense is if you only get confident in the technical stuff then you never get the unshakable confidence in performance because you haven't got right. the conf you haven't got the performance confidence yet and, I, and so i love this conversation and sort of the things that you're raising because it resonates well with what i believe uh, this idea mm. that you've got to spend time practicing the performance so that you can gain essentially then the unshakable confidence from a performance point of you too. So I, I've got the confidence in my swing, so I don't have to think about that too much. So you need that confidence. You need that confidence from the competence. But then to go practice the performance element too. And I don't know, um, by my, but by my understanding in, in golf, there's also decision making. You know, I watch these Instagram reels and these things with it. Every guy's got a tip and a trick and a, um, uh, you know, some hack that they promoting that yeah. help. Greg Palmer, or I don't even know if I'm using the right name. Right? Some, sure, some sure. Fam, <laughs> Might some as well just famous, be Greg Palmer. <laughs> yeah, some famous golfer that uh, I don't know. Yeah, you know, sure, and sure, uh, sure. I get the idea. Yeah, you know, and so so I think there's there's a lot to be said for that. You know, like that ability to put yourself under pressure in practice already, and it's difficult because it's not the same. It's not the same as being in actual competition. You know, I, I I follow you on 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 uh, X, I suppose we should call it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I I'm I am the the thing that always stands out for me with you is that you 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 show how you put these things to test. Like you talk about your own journey as a golfer, you know, as well as you post sort of tips, uh, you know, or guidance maybe is a better sure. word around the mental sure. game. If you think of sort of your own journey and the things that you struggled with and these things that we sort of speak about, 
how, how do you how do you do that like how does you how do you flip that switch from a technical to a performance you know yeah my my favorite way to look at it is is kind of like a studying versus test taking analogy metaphor whatever but you you've got the studying phase of you know you're studying for an exam that's in a month from now so you you can wait till the very end and cram and try to figure it out then and that would be like i barely got to practice this whole month so i'm just going to hit a the the 3 days leading up to it i'm just going to hit a ton of golf balls and hope that i find something by the Saturday, by, by the time Saturday rolls around for the actual tournament, you might band-aid it together, but that's no way to ultimately possess the ability. So cramming, not a great solution. The, the better way to, uh, I guess the most foolproof way to pass a test or to get a good grade on a test is to study from the moment that you know the test is coming. So you... You study diligently, you study uh, systematically, you time it out, you space it out really good, and you um, you do it in a quality way. There's good ways to study and there's bad ways to study. So you do it in the right way. And then come time for the test, it's not open book. You can't use your notes. You have to, the test is laid down in front of you and you just have to take it. So at that point, you could say, okay, I'm going to, I mean, there's there's not even an option to continue to study while you're taking the test. You simply just have to let's test my knowledge. Literally, that's I would assume that's where the uh, term is comes from. Is because we're um, we're testing your knowledge. We're not testing your ability to study today. We're testing your knowledge that you possess currently today. And after that test, you get a grade. Okay, I got a fifty percent. Right, I. I did pretty bad, right? I only knew half the answers. That tells you something. That gives you feedback on, okay, you only learned this much, right? You only know this much. You've got a lot of work to do. In golf and cricket, you get, you don't fail the class, right? You get to keep going, right? You get it. There's another test coming and it could be two days from now. It could be two months from now. Who knows? But you get to take that feedback and apply it to, okay, my studying needs to change a little bit, right? I already got that knowledge that I did really well, but now I clearly I don't know this part. I need to work on this part. So I need to get back to studying. But come time for the test, I could spend that whole test time uh, worrying about whether or not I studied enough, trying to think back to my studying, or I could just simply, let's test my knowledge. So I like the idea of a round of golf or a tournament especially as a test of your ability and the reason why i think that's so important is because it gets you out of that i need to this this round of golf or this tournament is more practice it's more studying no i don't think it should be i think if you're taking the long view here then this tournament is a test for your practice up to this point you're going to get some feedback, you're going to take stats, you're, and you're going to adjust your practice plan going forward to say, okay, well, I need to, I'm not good at, the, like, I, I drove it well, I hit the ball, I, I hit my irons well, but I didn't get any up and down, and I've had a ton of punt, I've missed a bunch of short putts. Well, then you know what you need to work on, and now it's time to get back to work, work diligently, work systematically, and then go test it again. And that helps the, that's the skill acquisition, skill access, balance. I think that, um, that matches up perfectly. And then come time for the test, you're able to better let go knowing I studied well. Come time for the tournament, you can let go knowing I practiced really well over this last month. So I can more readily let go. And that letting go allows for skill access so much better. As you, as you started it, I I'm thinking of sort of the, the, 
if we, if we had to think of the mindset side of this, right? It's like you're speaking. Yeah, it's a nice analogy, story, uh, metaphor, mm. whatever the mm -hmm. right word is there. I don't I never know. <laughs> um, Me neither. And, and maybe easy to remember, but it, it sort of speaks very much directly to a learning mindset, an ability to take feedback and how you, you know, and that you can, that you're able to take on feedback, learn yeah. about yourself and then have a, a plan, a preparation plan in place in order to make sure that you, you know, take on that feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're golf, putting the right? feedback into practice. Yeah. Putting the feedback into practice. I mean, <laughs> cricket is a frustrating game. It is. Uh, batters, especially batting, especially batting. Bowling, mm. less so, less so, because bowling, depending on the format that you play, you can bowl anywhere between 24 to unlimited balls. In a, in, in a given game. So like in a T20 game, you bowl four overs maximum, which is 24 balls. In a 50 over game, you can bowl 10 overs maximum, which would be 60 balls. And if you play a test well, how long can your body last? Like literally you can bowl two days in a row, 20 to 30 to 40 overs. Um, and, and, and so bowlers have a little bit more, I think as a tendency they have, there's more opportunity, you know? Mm. Batters have one chance. You got one chance. You make a mistake, you get out, you can go sit, you sit for the rest of the game, you you, you sit and you gotta go field. That's that's it's not like baseball where yeah. I think you can come back in another right. inning, you have not the same. You have one opportunity. Mm. And so there's a the pressure on batters, along with all the other stuff we spoke about earlier, all that decision making that takes place. Mm. It it is quite intense and it gets quite hectic. And so often, and you see this in golf too, right? where there's this I've got to be perfect almost mindset that comes into the game. You see golfers break their golf clubs, hit it around mm. trees. Um, batters will throw their bats through windows. The helmets will bounce all over the place. You know, and so there's a, it's easy, I think, to get trapped in like that mindset of perfection. And because if, mm. and it's easy to get sort of think like, if I can do this perfectly, then I will do well. And so I'm not perfect yet which can then speak to your self-worth and your identity and all these facets that can come Absolutely. into play from a mental point of view, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you find, like when, let's say somebody's stuck in that, right? Like let's say they're stuck in a bit of this beating on themselves, perfection. How, how do you think we get out of that? How do you think we can alleviate that for ourselves? We got to discredit the belief. We got to, we got to cut right through and challenge the, the thing, the, what I call it is the kind of the lie we're telling ourselves. So when you, when you assume I have to be perfect here and then cricket sounds like that mindset is much in golf. You, you are the only one you get every chance, right? There's no, I, I can imagine a scenario where a round of golf is played with 30 different people and you only get one chance to hit one shot, that would be extreme pressure, right? And it, that would be very, very difficult. So in cricket, this is ramp, uh, ratcheted up, sounds like, to another level. But if even then, if you assume I have to be perfect, that is, you're basically saying that this is my one chance ever. It might be your one chance today and tomorrow or however long, however long the, uh, it goes, but it's not ultimately true unless you literally are retiring or something right after this, this might be your last chance. And in that case, you have to simply accept it and you have to choose, okay, how am I going to do this? How do I want my last chance to go? And even then you want to say, do I really want to spend this completely anxious about it going perfectly? No. So even more so when you know, I've got more chances coming in the future. Now, they might be few and far between. Each one might have a lot of pressure to it, but it's not over, right? Assuming that you have to be perfect or believing that you have to be perfect assumes that they, you, you will never get another chance. And that's simply not true for 99% of us. There's always another round of golf. There's always another golf shot to hit. There's, there's always more cricket to play. 
and and the built up pressure of it the belief the perfectionism belief is coming from a probably an untrue source so you have to have to catch yourself telling yourself those lies or believing the lies that are randomly popping in your head you need to be perfect here okay do i really okay why do i think i need to be perfect well this just matters that much so much okay does it like okay yeah this is in front of thousands millions of people or whatever okay it why does that mean that it matters so much well i guess when you say it like that it doesn't really and you know in 5 years no one's going to remember this or in seven days after the next one, no one's going to remember this, maybe. So basically, you are arguing with yourself. That might be too kind of too much sounding like a fight with yourself, but you're basically questioning the, the lies that your brain throws at you that, that says, you need to be this way. Okay, do I really? Do I need to? And a lot of like golf golfers tend to say, I just have to get off to a good start. If I want to contend this week, I need to get off to a good start. Okay, you have now set up the situation where getting off to a bad start is unacceptable. And it's impossible to be in contention if you get off to a bad start. Is that true? Well, actually, now that you mention it, no. I've, I've started terribly before and still finished just fine. Like I've had, I've had my worst game and still played pretty well. Okay, well, you just discredited it right there. You've just diffused this limiting belief that was causing you to play anxiously, to start off anxiously. So you have to, you can't just say, just relax and play. Well, if you have a deeper belief of this is it, this is all that matters, this is life or death, well, it's going to be hard to just relax and play. So you need to discredit the underlying beliefs of this is life or death. This is it. This is the last chance I'll ever get. Well, that's just simply not true. You have to discredit that. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. I think that's good advice. I have a, um, uh, I'm definitely stealing this, right? This is an awareness I've had in this conversation. Sure. That's, I'm stealing it's all one of this. the reasons. No, I mean, it's one of the reasons I'm doing the podcast, right? <laughs> because I learn mm. every single podcast, there's a little something I take away. And I've always had this, um, I've had this understanding that if you ask yourself this question, like, why is this important to me? And you load meaning onto something, right? You add additional meaning. You raise the tension level in your body, right? So mm -hmm. especially if you're quite flat, if you're, if you're unmotivated and sort of in a place where you're not really um, able to access your best because you're a little bit undercooked then I think by asking yourself a question like, you know, well, why is this actually important to me? Why is it important that I start well? You know, why is it important that I have a good round of golf here? Mm. But the problem with that, the problem with that is that if you create and you set that meaning up in the way that you sort of, those examples that you gave, then they become the pressure through which your performance actually then gets hampered. So there's always this fine balance for me that I've had an awareness of in my mind of making something too important yes and, and 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 when it becomes too important too meaningful then i think it drags us down more than it actually allows us to perform it doesn't set us free you know it doesn't allow right. us to play with freedom it, it can make us go tight because now this is too important mm. and so i've never had a strategy to de-escalate i've never had mm. that up until this moment and i like and the question for that will just be really yeah. Like, is that, right. are you saying that really? Like, is, is it really, yeah. is it really that? And so I love right. that. I, I'm, I'm definitely stealing yeah, that yeah, from, yeah. This, from this conversation is that ability to, when something becomes too meaningful, then you could just question it in a, to, to sort of bring it back down to earth. Well, really, is that, okay, no, it's not that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So then, and maybe a good follow up question could be so then what is it? You know, like, yeah. what is it then really? Okay, cool. Yes. Well, it is actually this. And then I think by doing something like that, by loading a meaning and being able to sort of bring it back down if need be, and then being able to um, sort of ask, well, what's it really about? In that way, we can get ourselves to focus on the right thing at the right time. You mentioned the word yes. attention a little bit earlier. Um, yes. You're, yeah. I mean, you're nailing it. You, so I like, I like it on kind of a 
zero to 10 scale as far as your intensity. So if you are my, my version, like you're saying is to deescalate, you're up there at a nine or a 10, you're anxious, you're afraid of how this might go. Uh, you're, which makes you play scared and, and because you're so worried about it not going well, because this is it. I need to be perfect here. Well, you're at a nine or a 10, you need to do something to bring it down, which is okay here. Let's, let's, uh, level set and, and ask, okay, is that true? Is this it? Like, is this life or death? Well, no. Um, okay. What is it then? Right. I, I love that question. So then what is it actually? That's, that's the definition of acceptance that I heard one time uh, talking about stealing things. The definition of acceptance is seeing things as they are, not as you wish they were. So, so then when you, when you see it as it is, that brings you down to a five from your nine or 10. Now, if you're down at a zero or a one, most of the golfers that I work with, I don't know any of them that are too low. The very fact that they are paying me to help them usually means that they care too much. They don't care too little. But if you are in, if you are in the situation where you're at a zero or a one or a two, and that five is your personal sweet spot, then you need to impart meaning to it, like you're saying. Then you're not, you're not caring enough. You're not seeing, this actually matters to me, and I do care. And I, and in like in fairness i have been there many times where i've been demotivated you know depressed not you know just going through the motions do i really care to do this anymore i had to remind myself wait what am i really trying to do here i want to i want to play on the pga tour i want to accomplish these goals i want to get recruited to play in college and i had to reimpart meaning most of my golf career has been spent caring too much and I had to deescalate it. And when I did that, I played really well, but there were absolutely times where I was under, I was in the one zero or a one. I just don't even want to get out of bed and go, I, I just, I can't do it today. I don't want to do the grind. You got to remind yourself, okay, what are you going for? Right? You have to re-impart meaning. So I, maybe we're talking about back to the for, formula part of it is dialing in what this means to you. And aligning what it means to what it actually is, like getting those closer to each other. If it means way more than it actually is, then you're going to be nine or 10. If it means way less than it actually is, then why are you doing it in the first place? Maybe this isn't for you, or maybe you need to remind yourself what this actually means and what this actually is. So either way, getting to that sweet spot in the middle. Yeah, that's yeah. a great way to put it. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. I equate th that to like a cocktail. You know, if you go, have a cocktail at the bar if uh, mm. it gets mixed right so a whole bunch of so if i think of the formula to performance and and by the way i have an actual formula from a i have an actual formula that i use cool. um i want to know uh, but i but i equate it to like a, a cocktail and so a cocktail gets mixed it's a mixture of things and if something in the cocktail is out of whack if there's too much of a bitters in there or some alcohol or something that's too sweet then the cocktail actually doesn't taste nice, mm. you know, and it's not an enjoyable, especially if it's a cocktail you enjoy, you know? Right. And so I right. think it's every person's responsibility as an athlete to learn what their cocktail is. And so part mm. of that would be uh, a, a measure and an understanding of your optimal tension level. You know, am I a eight out of 10 guy? And I think you said it beautifully there, you know, like if a five is, yours right if that's right. where you need to be right. because i might need to be at a seven or eight i need to be ramped up a little bit more somebody else might need to be at a two or three mm. um you know but mm. yeah so yep. i think that's pretty awesome so my so my formula is and and this is stolen by the way stolen and slightly sure. tweaked it's stolen from sure. the inner game books uh written oh, yeah. by timothy Good galloway books. which yeah which speak um which speak about um his formula is performance is equal to your potential. He says minus the interferences. I, my, yeah. The way I tweaked it is times the interferences because I think the interferences play a big part. And sometimes interferences add to the cocktail. Sometimes, sometimes there's an external source. Uh, somebody walks past you and they say something to you, which is an interference, which can easily derail you. 
and it ramps up you to get more into your sweet spot. Yeah. So I prefer to go with times interference, but also because you times it, the interference has a greater, it, it derails in a big way. So if it's something small, yeah. even if it's something small, to think of it as something that can have a big impact, you know, and obviously if it's something big, then it'll have just an even bigger impact. And so I like the mm. idea that it's not minus interferences, but it's times. Sure. Because yeah, because it's and interferences could yeah. be internally or externally. I could have a random thought today, which is an interference, but it just ramps me up. It gets me into yeah. which is something that yeah, you know, um, a, a family member dies. This happens mm. to a lot of people, and it has a big impact on performance. Right? It's a big mm. traumatic event. But I know cricketers who their parents passed away, and they dedicated their next game to their dad. So it's an interference. It's not something that's normally going to be there. And then that thing has a big impact on their ability to yeah. to uh, to to focus. And then so and then I put a over divided by pressure, pressure your ability to manage and cope with the pressures of performance. Because right. if you're not able to do that, if you don't have strategies in place, then I right. think your performance gets derailed. And I'm not saying it's the yes. holy grail or anything like that, but that's my that's my actual right. formula for performance. No, I like that because. Um, assuming interference is negative, isn't, I don't think that's correct. I think interference is neutral. I think there, um, you might even change the term. You, you could certainly change the term to stimuli or, or stimulus or something, right? Sensory input. <laughs> um, sensory input thing, something yeah. you encounter, right? Putting a more neutral label on it, but Interference is a, is a nice word for it because then all that all that is is, um, it's it puts you in a frame of how do I interpret this thing that happened to me? Obviously, a parent passes away. That's by all accounts that is not a good thing, right? That's a negative thing. But you can choose how you respond to the thing, right? Let yourself grieve. Let yourself be sad but then be fueled by it, right? You could let it bring you down and you never come back up. And there are situations where that happens and that's completely perfectly normal. And certain situations are worse than others. So we can't put a blanket over all of it. But I think without having gone through any serious trauma myself, so get back to me after I have, but you can always respond to anything you go through. You can choose how you respond to anything you go through, whether that thing would be deemed good or bad. I think you can always choose how you respond. So interference is kind of in the eye of the beholder a little bit. It's it's how you perceive the interference, whether or not it's a helpful multiplication or a neg a positive multiplication or a negative multiplication. But I love that way to think about it. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Josh, if there was anything in your mind that you thought we were going to talk about that we didn't, what would that have been? I mean, based on the name of the podcast, I think we destroyed that dead horse. I, I think we, I think we have, I, I love your formula and I, I think we have added to the nuance of the formula because um, getting at getting at kind of the first principles, the uh, best practices of, okay, how am I going to perform as good as possible? I mean, some people, hope, you know, listening to this, hopefully not, but some people will go right to, well, I need to get my technique right. That's the formula. Like you said, you led at the top with that. So introducing, well, no, right? That, that is one small piece of the pie that is performance. So introducing more and more of those concepts can't hurt, right? So that's exactly what I thought we were going to cover. And I think we did it well to, to answer awesome. your question. So I, I think this was awesome. Yeah, brilliant. I've, lo I've loved this conversation. Thanks for allowing me to share a bit of my stuff too yeah. in between and commenting yeah. on that. I, I appreciate that. I need to learn more about cricket. It sounds incredibly <laughs> difficult and intense and fun to watch. Dramatic. Yeah. No, and and it is, it is, it can be, it it, it could be quite hectic. And I mean, it, the the longest format is five days, 
you play it over a period of five days, 90 overs in a day, which equates to, I think it's a total of 540 balls that mm. get bowled over the over mm. the course of a of one game. Uh, batters How long would one day of, last, in theory? Uh, Sorry to the ga- interrupt The day you. would start around 10 o'clock in the morning, and then it'll end between 5 and 6 in the evening. And then there's two breaks, a lunch break, which is normally 40 minutes, and a tea break, which is normally 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah it's long days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so That's in a outrageous. period of... In, in each of the, and there's like a two hour period in between. So playing time is two hours, two hours, two hours. Um, and then it can go longer in the end because you've got to do a minimum of 90 overs in a day. So if, if the team that's bowling is behind, got they've 90. got to finish. You've got to get to 90, unless there's weather or bad light um, mm. or things like that that interferes. Sure. But for the most part, yeah, wow. you've got to get the, Dang. you can get more in. I need you to... can get more than 90 overs in even, sure. if you want to, but the minimum but of minimum. 90. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Man, that sounds I think my math was off because awesome. ninety I think my math was off because ninety times six, which is an over, is uh what's that? Three hundred and no, five hundred and no. That's five hundred and forty, isn't it? Yeah. I think yeah. you nailed it. Yeah, so it's five hundred and forty yeah. not in a game in a day. Yeah. Five hundred and forty balls Got in it. a day. Wow. In one day. So you times that by five, that will be the total volume that cricketers could potentially put their bodies Goodness. through. Yeah. Wow. And so in all That's of exhausting. that, in all of that, batters have two opportunities to bat. They they get in all two potential five days? In all five days they got two opportunities to bat. My goodness. That's some yeah. pressure. <laughs> yeah. Some, some serious pressure. pressure with That's how complicated pressure. and difficult it is when you have that chance. Man, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, totally crazy. Um, it's cool to know that you're out in Morrisville. I've got a, uh, I've had yeah. a guest on the podcast. Um, I don't know if you know him, Jacques Dallaire. Um, he's from motorsport. He stays about two hours away from Morrisville. Yeah. Wow. No kidding. One of, I mean, all my podcasts are pretty good. This was a pretty good one. But that yeah. podcast stands out at that time was most yeah. probably one of the best ones because it was a similar conversation in that it was just very succinct, very clear, not too messy, um, mm. crisp ideas, easy to communicate. Mm. And so I think for me personally, those are conversations I enjoy because they can, you can, you can take a lot from them, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, he, it's no surprise where we live right here in the same area. It's, this is where all the bright minds are. So yeah. you need to get over here too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm working on that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on that. <laughs> nice, yeah. nice, nice. Josh, or this has been really cool. I, I thank you for your time. If people want to, if people want to sort of, if they're listening to this and they want to reach out to you, what would be the best possible way for them to do that? Yeah. So as soon as you're done listening to the Performance Formula, head over to if you're interested in golf. And I, I, I'd like to say that my podcast, just like yours is applicable to kind of psychology in general, sport psychology in general, but it's called the mental golf show. That's kind of my main thing. And then everything else I do kind of branches off of that Twitter X Instagram, uh, newsletter. Uh, so if you kind of want to find me wherever I am, you can go to Josh Nichols golf.com. So the mental golf show podcast and Josh Nichols golf.com. That's kind of the, the two places I would send people. Perfect. I'll make sure that that's linked in my notes below. Awesome. So that people can just you, access Jared. it straight from there. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for your time. Really, really appreciate uh, you giving me a little bit of your time so that we could have this awesome conversation. Of course. Thank you so much, Jody. This has been an honor and a pleasure, and I've learned a lot in this conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Mm-hmm.